welcome back, guys, to the Guy and Ice no, podcast. No, for real, welcome back. We tried this once already. We did. This is the second take. Uh, today, we uh, have a very special guest. I'm going to let Grant intro him, but he's, uh, he's a great dude, and we've known him for years. Yeah, man. It's been uh, a pleasure getting to be a part of his great work of American Ninja Warrior, uh, the producer, executive producer, Kent Weed, and um, he's with us today. Uh, I've also had a lot of just cool experience with him outside the show. So um, I'm excited to get into it, man. Hey, welcome to the show. Welcome to Kind of Nice. It's great to have you. Thank you, Rant. Good to be here, man. Good to good to see you guys and uh, miss you. Yeah, man. For sure, man. Yeah, it's been a minute. It has been. And um, as we're rolling into another season of Ninja, you got new stuff on the horizon. You got all kinds of stuff popping off. And um, I got over the years, like it's been nice to see the other work and stuff that you do. It's not just been Ninja and looking at your um, IMDB, man, that thing is long. That thing has some accolades. <laughs> yeah, it also shows how long I've been doing this, right? <laughs> yeah, which is, which is cool. Yeah, well, I've been, uh, you know, directing and producing for about 30 years now. So, um, hundreds of shows, you know, lots of, uh, lots of different genres, everything from music and talk shows to game shows to, you know, unscripted. So it's been a lot of, it's been a great ride. So I have really enjoyed it. And, and, um, and I also really, you know, am very much involved in, uh, environmentalist activist. I'm, you know, on the board of Waterkeeper Alliance, I'm very much into mindfulness and meditation and how that can improve your life, everything from sleeping to stress and anxiety. So I'm about, you know, making a difference in people's lives and helping change the world. And, uh, and I'm glad to, um, American enjoy is all part of that. You know, it's all about making people overcoming obstacles in their lives to compete on the hardest obstacle course in the world. And, and it's a, a great uh, testament to uh, people's resilience and their way to overcome adversity and, and face challenges. So very proud to be part of it. Yeah. I mean, not just a part of it, man. You're heading it up and, and, and putting it together. I mean, you're, you're leading it. And, and in that, I'm curious, yeah. what, what does that look like for you? What are some of the things when you think about the show, you're like, what do we want this show to achieve? Uh, when you think of American Ninja Warrior, what is the hopes that you want to achieve through the show? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because it's evolved over time. When, when Arthur and I first created the show, oh my gosh, you know, 14 years ago, um, you know, it was it was primarily just a show um, about a ma more male dominant, um, you know, athletic about parkour and um, CrossFit athletes kind of competing uh, on a show. And, you know, what we learned right away by telling stories and telling the stories of our athletes in much the same way that the Olympics do. You know, not everybody gets into curling, but when you hear the stories of the people behind the curling, all of a sudden it becomes interesting to watch. And that's yeah. kind of what we did with American Ninja Warriors, tell stories of amazing people and what they're overcoming in their lives to do what they're doing. Yeah. And so what we do each year is, is keep telling more stories, find new stories, tell those stories. And the great thing about it is why we see so many re repeats with athletes coming back in here, their stories evolve and their stories change. And so we get to tell some new stories every year, which is really exciting. And you know, then there's the whole aspect of the obstacles, which, um, you know, me and the team are always busy creating new obstacles that challenge the athletes. You guys know that because you've been <laughs> yeah, part yeah. of it for long and you, you're always surprised to see what we come up with and uh, what our crazy brains are able to, you know, you know, come up with. And the beauty of this is is now it's involving it's involving the, you know the, the competitors themselves you're, you tried that and, and we're able to take those and brainstorm new ways to the internet is not liking us today to constantly challenge you too and and, and it, what happened right. the internet keeps like cutting out a little bit i don't I, but we're we're still getting your yeah, point we're across, getting a, so. we're getting a little bit but yeah. i think Did I cut out a no, little no, bit no. yeah you're, you're just kind of chopping but we, we get the idea you for first off that you're saying Hey, you know, we're getting new obstacles and we're like, dang it, he's out of something new. Uh, but also <laughs> that uh, you have the storylines and, you know, that, that, that you get to tell new stories, even with repeat people. And um, yeah. so with that, you know, this the last couple of years, we're, we're talking about the introduction of youth and a higher level of athleticism. And even if we look back, we go, wow, we've actually stepped up the level of obstacles to a really high level. And something I always thought was like you know, let's say the, um, the dad or mom off the couch story 
is kind of hard to do anymore because it's such the obstacles are so much harder that yeah. someone who doesn't actually train it can't do it. What have you seen evolve with um with especially with the youth coming in? What's a direction you can go with that? Is that uh, that we want, you know, a higher level athleticism or, or is just a new story there or what's the direction heading towards? Well, it's interesting. The youth brought a whole new dynamic to the, to the, the competition and to, and to the show as well. And I think what we're seeing is the involvement of the sport and, and like in other sports and you know, listen, you see it in the Olympics right now and the winter Olympics are on right now. And look at the age of these people competing. You know, I saw this, some of the snowboarding last night and, they're 15, 17, 18 years old, right? Yeah. And these are top the, 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 the Russian figure skater is 15 years old. She's the best in the world. Mm. So so it is, we are actually following kind of a, a pattern that has happened before in professional sports and is now really hit us, you know, head on. Yeah. And the youth will drive us to, to keep making the, the, the courses, the obstacles more challenging. And to your point, um, Grant, it, it may push you out some of these these dads and moms on the couch watching it and then wanting to compete in the next season because the level of competition is is increased so much. Yeah. And but I think we have to go where where it, where it takes us and where the sport takes us. From your perspective, though, because I've, I've talked to many people, we talked, we had Jesse Le, LeBrec on the show last week, we touched on this specifically, but from your perspective, because I know when you first created the show, you you wanted to just inspire people, and it, it was about, like, having people from different walks of life coming together, and, like, the show being an ultimate equalizer, and being able to inspire people through that, but now, I think the the show has always been a balance between, like, I don't want to say reality TV, but like a TV show that makes it like fun to watch that, like you said, like curling isn't fun to watch, but when you have storylines behind people, you can get, you can get down with it. But with the show, it's always been juggling like athletic competition with like TV show, right? There's this, there's this balance. And I feel like that balance is getting tipped with like the, the youth coming in is now like leaning more towards athletic competition and less towards like TV show. Cause realistically talking to, to some people, it's harder for, the average viewer to connect with a teenager than it is like somebody that's like in their thirties or forties, that's a mom or dad. So, so I've talked to people that are like, man, I used to love the show, but it's hard for me to connect with these kids. Cause it's like, I liked watching people that could be me as a show. Now I'm sure the youth is getting more inspired, which is great. But so by doing that, you kind of take away the aspect of like, um, of just the, the mass majority of the people that, that it, the best way to put it for me is, is is the show is great. It's, it's becoming more and more competitive, which I like, but it's becoming more of a show that, that is like the, I feel like the viewership is more going to be youthful than, um, it used to be. Right. Yeah. I think, listen, you bring up a very good point, which is, and it's something that we always consider, um, in any, in any show is that, um, that we produce is that the stories that the youth have are very limited because they have less time on earth. Yeah. <laughs> they have less experience to, to have these stories and have these experiences and life experiences, right? So when you have an 18 year old in there and, and how much life experience can they have unless they came from a broken you know marriage or a broken, broken family or some face some adversity as a child or overcome something else, but but you have a lot less to, to, to pick from. So back to what you said earlier about a balance. Yeah, it's, it's much about a balance now. So we can't have a whole show about just young people competing because there would there would be very little story. There'd be very little story to tell or the stories that we tell would be the same, you know, because they're all, you know, started working on Ninja. They've been watching Ninja since they were five years old and it's been their yeah. whole life. They've been training at it and and. You know, it's just not interesting to tell, to do a series or to do a TV show about uh, a bunch of gym rats that, that all. Yeah, absolutely. All they do is train. Um, but you're right. The, the relatability becomes less than that factor. So I think we, we really strive to create a balance and, and to have some of that because I think it's important to have that and to increase the, the youth viewership. And I mean, listen, all networks want to have younger viewers uh, yeah. because network television is you know is primarily you know people over 40 everybody else is you know into streaming or and and you know or just watching it on you know their their phones and other you know other uh platforms so you know we to be able to do something that brings in a younger viewer is a good thing yeah uh, but you can't do too much 
So it's about creating the balance, like you said. Well, yeah, of course. It, like knowing that, like they could come at a cost of losing some older viewers. But I want to, I want to ask like a specific question: Is do you think this show could survive as like a purely athletic competition if you took away like the TV aspect of it or like the backstories, and it's strictly just people running the course, like just an athletic competition in its purest form? Uh, I, I think it could survive, but not in the, not on, not on a network, not on a broad yeah. network that has a broad audience reach. It, it could in a niche world on a niche net, network, like yeah. a purely sports network, but then you have a lot less viewers and it's a much smaller audience too. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. the beauty of what we did is we took something that was very niche and we broadened it out. Yeah. Much no, the same way when, when we did Hell's Kitchen, when we did cooking that, you know, started cooking Hell's Kitchen on 2004. And when Arthur and I created that show, there was no cooking on, on national on network television. You None at all. Cooking but we TV. took something that was very That's niche crazy. and brought that brought it out. Yeah, yeah. That was the, it. Was a very the, the first one. yeah. So very smooth. And now I we're mean, going into our twenty second season. So. Yeah, I, I what last I checked was two hundred and eighty three episodes. I mean that's. That's wild to think to take something like that. And you would ask me, you sure. know, like, do I watch what I want to watch cooking? You, I could see the involvement even just in my life watching like that's not something I would do. And now I'm 33. I love cooking. I want to turn it on. I want to see like what someone's making. I like the, uh, the you know, everything from the, the style of the food when it's done. You're like, oh, I want to eat that to like the drama in the kitchen and what's happening. You're like, why is he so mad? Well, tell him <laughs> what, you know, so mad? don't throw the pan. Like all of it is it's exciting. So that's, I mean, that's what you did yeah. to take a niche thing and grow it. It's, it's pretty cool. And I yeah. obviously very successful. Yeah. Well, much the same with, with Ninja, Hell, the Hell's Kitchen is the same way. It's not that interesting to watch someone cook a dish unless you care about them. So by telling their stories and their backstories, you get vested in that person and then you care if they succeed or fail. Same, the same thing applies with Ninja Warrior. Yeah. No. Um, touching on, I, cause I was doing some research and, I didn't realize that you were the co in Arthur Smith and co. I thought the co was just like everybody, but I realized that, <laughs> that I learned that story and I was like, that's crazy. But I, I hear you talk about you like doing that, knowing that you were going to step down one day. And at this point we're talking, you have stepped down, but you're still on like the, the Ninja warrior um, production. Like as like you stayed on as an executive for Ninja warrior. Right. But you're not, you're no longer in the a Smith and co company um, for two. It's a two part question. How did you like, cause you're starting off this company, like from scratch, you're putting in your own money. Like, it's weird to me that you would know that you're going to back out eventually. Right. Usually when you go into something, you're like, this is going to be my baby. Like, I don't ever want to leave it, but you're, you're going into this and you're like, okay, I'm okay with giving him the name because I know eventually I'm going to step out. Um, how did that go? And then also, why did you choose Ninja Warrior to stay on as an executive versus like other shows that the company produces? Sure. Well, the first question is is more of a uh, a sense I had, an intuition I had. I I I said to myself at the time, I said, if I ever want to leave, if I ever want to get out, it's going to be much harder if my name's on the door. Yeah. It's going to be much harder to you know because we had another comp we had we had sub subsidiary companies and we had Smith and Weed Productions, which was our union company back in the in the day, and um, but I I had this sense that maybe one day I might not want to do this and it would be easier to leave if my name wasn't on the door. And that was it. I didn't really have a plan that I was going to leave or I never like said, okay, in 10 years, I'm going to leave or 15 years, I'm going to leave or 20 years, I'm going to leave. It just was kind of a, a sense. And, uh, you know, and Arthur had come to me to form the company. And so I was, you know, I was fine with it. I, you know, I'd always been, you know, the, the, the director behind the camera that, you know, the guy behind the scenes, pulling the, pulling the strings. And so I didn't have to take the spotlight. I wasn't, you yeah. know, it wasn't as important to me. Uh, and then secondly, why I, after, uh, you know, I left the company, I, the two shows that I primarily kept were Hell's Kitchen and, and Ninja Warrior, which are the two shows that I created with Arthur. So I really was passionate about those shows. Those are shows I created. They were my babies. And I wanted to do those for as long as I could or as long as they were you know, around. So, so I kept those. And the other reason, truthfully, was that I really feel that those shows, especially Ninja Warrior, are shows that align with my purpose, which is to create programming that makes a difference in people's lives and that inspires people and helps create a shift. You know, I, I've said this quote many times and it's, I, I, love, I love Ninja Warrior because it's a show that gets, you know, kids away from video games and parents off the couch playing in the backyard with the, as a family again. And, yeah. and I still believe that to this day that it still does that. And I approach all the time from parents and, 
how much it's, you know, helped their kids and how much it's helped their families. So I, I really feel like it's, 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 it's entertaining television and it's entertainment in a really wholesome manner and wholesome way that's creating family, family values, which is hard to find on TV these days. No. Yeah. It's, it's very unique. Absolutely. And to give you just some more data on that, like I live in the, the data end of that. I, everywhere I go and meet people at the airport or I'm at the grocery store, the people that come up to me are people that said, Hey man, I lost 10 pounds or Hey man, me and my kid love to watch this every night or Hey, it's always this. I'm, I am the data receiver of, yes, that is actually happening. And why people go, why do you do Ninja Warrior? I'm like, because it actually ch makes change in people's lives. I watch the change. It's not like, well, someone may have commented and said, hey, man, I, I tried this training you did, and that's cool. That's great, and I'm sure that is real change. But I literally meet people who have like, look, here's my photo. Look, this is me now. I lost this weight. Or me and my kid have this closer relationship over this show. So it is happening. Yeah. I'm seeing it too. So big on way to go on that. Uh, so you, do Grant. you feel, what do you feel like is your biggest achievement then in, in producing or in life? But like, these are two great shows, obviously Hell's Kitchen and Ninja Warrior can, we can see the accolades and the episodes and the recurring, but to you, what has been your, what has been your biggest achievement? Um, That's a, I, that's a tough question. I, I really, you know, I don't know if I've ever had my biggest achievement yet, to be honest with you. I think that um, I still am wanting to affect as many people as possible in a very positive manner and make a difference in people's lives and and help, you know, help them create joy, find purpose, you know, relief, suffering, you know, in their lives. And whether that be through stress, anxiety, depression, whatever, you know, that they're facing. So um, their entertainment's one way to do that, you know, which we've done. And um but uh, I, I, I just want to be a positive influence, you know, in this world. And I want to, you know, whether it's through Waterkeeper and helping bring awareness to, you know, you know, clean water and then the need for protecting our water and our clean water rights and and or it's or, you know, through doing programs like like we talked about or through my meditation program and, and helping people through my experience, my, you know, I've seen it make a difference in my life. So. Yeah. My biggest achievement, I don't, I mean, I don't, you know, it's, it, I don't know yet. I really don't. I wish I had a, like a, oh, it's this or it's that, or it, yeah. I don't, you know, it's not, you know, I, I don't have, I don't have it yet. I don't think I know what it is. And, and it's all, it all, it's cumulative, you know, it all piles on top of another. So just keep moving forward. Well then with that, what, what would be like a little sneak peek, man? What's a little, you know, give the people a little something. If they're well, going to go into your master class, yeah. what, it, what is it they're going to learn from you? What are these things that could, these could accumulate to be your greatest achievement, the, the good that you want to do in the world. What are they going to learn from one of your master classes? Well, they're going to learn how to deal with life in a different way and, different, and look at life through a different lens, change the way you look at things. You look at, the things you look at change. If you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. So um, by changing your perspective on things, you get a whole new look at the world and you look at it from a different lens and you see things differently. So rather than walk around worrying and think, living in the past, thinking about the things you didn't do or worrying about the future, about things that you haven't done yet or need to do, you become more present centric and you become more mindful of what's right in front of you and the things you get to be thankful for that are in your life. And by changing that perspective, you enjoy your life more. Um, my, my master class is all about using mindfulness techniques and practices along with meditation to create this sense of always being mindful of where you are in the moment. And that allows you to handle stresses and stress rather than get caught up in all the worry and, and angst that, that surrounds them that we currently live in. It kind of, I always, I always say that it, 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 you know, there's a lot of us that walk around the world today and culture and our society that kind of like, it's like the matrix. We're all plugged in and we just kind of like an automatic pilot. We just go around and, and do every do the things we do every day, you know, and, and lather and repeat. But when you step back and you, you know, are accountable for the moment you're in and acknowledge where you're in at the moment, that changes, that changes dramatically. And yeah. then you, you know, start, you start noticing things differently and, and your life changes because of it. You start attracting more positive things in your life. You, you start manifesting things that, you know, that are your dreams and your goals uh, without having to write down goals on papers and all that stuff, just because of your actions and because of how you, you view things. Um, now that's kind of a, a, a really high over 
I'll 10,000 look above, you know, at it, but all the, uh, all the stuff that you're teaching is, is are things that like I've learned over like harder times in my life. And I think it's the question I want to ask is, is in essence, like, cause I don't feel like you'll, you'll, you'll have this epiphany of, I don't want to call it enlightenment, but I'm going to use that word in lack of like a better term, but people who understand like mindfulness, meditation perspective, like all these different things are people usually that I've met in life that have gone through some shit, right? Like nobody learns about these things without having a dark moment in their past. Because if, if life is easy and you're cruising and you're comfortable, you don't really need these things because it's just, it, life is good. So I guess, um, what, I mean, what have you, is, am I correct in assuming that like a dark time in your life has brought you to this epiphany of like finding these things? Cause for me, like all the stuff you're teaching is stuff that I have learned because of dark times in my life. Right. No, I remember, I remember in Dallas when you're, when you were dealing with things, some anxiety issues too, um, you know, a few years back. So I, I can totally relate to that, what you're talking about. Yes. For me, I've had, um, I, I did a speech down in Florida a year, two, two years ago in January, where I talk about obstacles, overcoming obstacles. And it was one of the, it was part of this tour that I was going to start with Ninja Warrior that every city we're going to, I was going to do a host the this live event and it was, it was on the docket and it was in January, 2020. And I had one in March, April, May, and June. And we had all the cities picked out and, you know, I invited a bunch of ninjas, ninjas to come and some, some of them were going to speak and it was called overcoming obstacles. Well, the speech I gave is talks about, here's 25 of the most common obstacles that people face in their life. And that's everything from going, being broke to losing, you know, a family member to, um, depression to, you know, facing drug or an alcohol addiction to all these things. And I, I listed 25 of them and I tell everybody about my, my rise to success and my, my bio, right? Cause everybody knows us by our bios, right? But then nobody really knows, nobody really knows the real you. They see your, your, your resume and they go, oh, he's been so successful. He's had such an easy life. You know, he's, uh, but I, then I went back and circled back after this bio. I said, but, but this is what happened, you know? Parents divorced, very angry parents fighting all the time at, at 12, moving, uh, moving away from state, you know, facing, you know, a rebel teen and, and issues with that. And, you know, facing, you know, drug addiction in my early 20s and then alcohol addiction. And, uh, you know, and I, I go on. And, so, yes, and that's the short answer was multiple, multiple um, things that I've faced in my life and and adversities and 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 overcome them and been resilient through them and and despite it all was able to make it through because I had an underlying passion or goal or to to, to survive and, and to to do good and to, and to be successful and so learning through those adversities and and becoming resilient allowed me to to come out the other side and and kind of find this you know peaceful serenity if you will and and to know that there's much more and and I don't think you have to ever Everybody has to go through that too, too, but we all face struggles. We all face obstacles in our life. Yeah. So having these tools, and I always I call it the obstacle toolkit. So having these these tools, you know, like every professional needs a toolkit, right? And ninjas all need a toolkit. You guys need a certain amount of tools to do your craft, right? And a lot of them are physical tools, and that comes through experience and practice and repetition and consistency and. And the same thing applies with the tools that I deal with mindfulness and meditation. It's rep repetitiveness, consistency, because, you know, it's one thing to meditate in the morning when you get up. But when you have these practices that you that incorporate through the day um, that you use throughout your day, then then they remind you. They constantly bring you back and bring you back. And one is I have a gratitude stone that I carry. It's a little stone I carry with me. And every time I touch it in my pocket, then it reminds me to be grateful for something, whatever it is in the moment. Yeah, it's like a cue. It's a little cute. It's a little, yeah. So there, and there's, there's a number of these that I have in my course that I teach, but so those are ways to kindly keep you, keep you present, keep you moment. And just yeah. like going, practicing and repetitiveness and consistency, you, you, you know, the thing is, it's not about doing, you know, going to the gym once a week. You guys know that you can't just go to the, practice once a week for two hours, Yeah. you know, or if you're learning to study an instrument like piano or guitar, you don't go to a, a piano teacher or a guitar teacher for one hour a week and then and put the guitar down. You get yeah. much more and you know, much more advancement and much more better at that instrument by practicing 10 minutes a day. Absolutely. So, yeah. Right. So it's the same, same concept in that regard. Yeah. I've been actually present in your mind and keeping it constantly. I've been keeping. learning a new like guitar, like uh, I'm learning like the bar chord better. And just uh -huh. like you said, like I'll do it 10 minutes every day versus like two hours one day. Cause I know two hours one day, I don't get that much more benefit, but I've learned in everything in life that, uh, especially when it comes to learning things physically is that if I just put in like small reps every day, 
the accumulation of that is so much bigger than if I just do like a heavy session once yeah. a week. And I think that's the way your brain works is I think when you're learning new skills, um, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, you probably know more about this than I do, but I think you learn when like you sleep, right? So you do the skill like during the day and then when you sleep, your brain kind of like wires it because I learned this with like jumping rope because I do like very like technical movements when I do that and guitar and piano is like I'll learn the thing and then I'll go to bed and the next day I'll realize that I'm a little bit better. But like in the same session, if I, I don't get better during that same session, it's the next day that I see the benefits, right? Yeah. No, where well, you're programming your brain to, to, to in your brain when you go to sleep, like you said, processes all those activity and thoughts you had during the day. And you know, you're actually rewiring your brain to 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 do new neural pathways in your brain to yeah. operate differently, think differently, process differently. And that's why all of a sudden things start changing and appearing in your life because your brain is being rewired. Yeah. To think more uh, positively. That's, you know, I'm one of the things I tell my kids, especially, you know, whenever they say, I can't do this or, you know, this is too hard. I say, you know, stop those negative thoughts. It's like, you got to get rid of those negative thoughts and rephrase it, you know? Yeah, yeah. You, you can't do it right now. But with more practice, you do it. You got it. You can't, yeah. well, your brain is a computer. It doesn't know the difference between a negative and a positive thought. It's just data. You input data, it processes data. So when you, constantly feed it negative thoughts, it's going to process that data and, and want to deliver on that data because that's the data you're feeding it. So why not replace it with positive thoughts and positive energy so that it, it reinforces that in your life? I, yeah. I feel like I operate in only the positive. I don't know. It's just natural to just, I, everyone's like, oh, you're so optimistic. I'm like, I don't know what to tell you, man. It's just kind of my natural state. And, um, and I, just, I agree with you. I see. I know that about you, Grant. Very much so. Yeah. <laughs> well, I wanted to tell a story on you. Uh, just one of the cool, positive things uh, that you also just have done in my life that I just want people to know about. I mean, one of the things <laughs> is that you, you know, you guys run this athletic show. You know, there's this hopes that you guys aren't just some guys that sit around overweight and don't do anything either, but no, you guys are athletic. You do triathlons. <clears throat> and I got a challenge in the off season of Ninja. I always like take on some weird thing. And like, I've been doing CrossFit this year and different stuff. Yeah. But one year I wanted to do a half Ironman and I don't know, I've never done a, I've never done a triathlon or anything. And, um, someone's like, Hey, you got a month to do this. You know, what sponsor was going to pay for it. And I was like, okay, cool. Uh, but I've never biked at all and I got to bike 56 miles. I've got to swim for the never swim run and all this stuff. And, uh, and you were like, Hey, I got a bike and I'm thinking, okay, cool. You know, I don't know much about bikes and not only is it a bike, it's like this 10 grand bike that you got with, uh, with Gordon Ramsay or something. And, and I just, you know, you were just like, yeah, just use this bike. And I remember you, you know, letting me not only fly this thing across the country so I could take it to the Ironman where I'm doing soul cycle classes, like two back to back, just pedaling in class, learning how to bike the distance I need to. And then this bike shows up and it legit made it easier. I mean, 10 grand bike is so light arrow handles the whole deal. And I'm, and I'm able to hold 21 miles an hour for 56 miles only because, you know, I've got this super nice bike. I'm like, you know, that was just a cool thing for me to, you got to just see this positive idea. I want to like, go try this challenge. You're like, Hey man, I got a $10,000 bike. Why don't you just ship it across the world and <laughs> try to use it? And you weren't like, don't break it. It's so important to me. You were like, yeah, I'd love for you to use it. So I just want people to see your kindness and extending there where I don't know how to bike. And you were just oh. like, tell me and try out my bike. I got it from this, uh, this thing with Gordon Ramsay. So thank you for that. Yeah, you're very welcome. Well, I listen. I like I shared with you at the time. I had the la I I had used it on my last um, triathlon, and it's a it was a, a full triathlon. It wasn't an Ironman, but it was a full triathlon, and it shaved two minutes, two and a half minutes off my 40k. Just the bike alone. I mean, I you know 100%. I had trained the same as I'd always trained. So um, I I'm so glad it worked out for you. And I, yeah, I, I mean, if you had wrecked on it and broken it, it would have been fine too because it's you know it's more about you know you get to use it and you know. It's just a, it's just a bike after all, right? So you're a legend for that because my car's not even worth that much. So. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. You know, here's the thing. You mentioned this earlier, which is we we aren't just these you know overweight producers that sit back and 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 I I take that very personal too. I I don't I don't feel it would be right for me to go around and talking about American Ninja Warrior and not be in shape myself. I don't I think that would be a contradiction. And I, I and I think it would it would be a lie. And so, 
you know, I don't know if you remember, um, this was when we did Ninja versus Ninja out at Hanson Dam. And I think it was Michelle Warnke who said, hey, try the wall, try the wall. And, and I and do the warp wall. And I, and I said, yeah. I don't have the right shoes. And then like three people walked over with shoes right here. <laughs> it's like, oh, f- <laughs> fudge. I got it. Now I, now I'm called and um, well, fortunately, I made it up the wall on my second try. Yeah. So at least Let's I didn't, didn't embarrass myself. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, everybody, all the ninjas were around me cheering me on. And I, uh, it was it was great to. Uh, and I, and it was nice also to feel that that community support, which I know and I talk about so much, which is the ninja community and how they support each other and how you all support each other. And it's real, it's genuine. It's not like any other sport in the world where you will cheer each other on, even as to cheer them to beat you. It doesn't, you know, it's more about the, the individuals and and cheering them on to do good, no matter you know if they're if they're a competitor or your or your rival. And there's really, even though everybody wants to win or everybody, no matter how where you are. Um, you cheer for them even if even if you lose to them, and I always think that's 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 what sports should be like. You know, it should really be about you know conscious competitiveness. You know, where you're you know you're supporting each other, um, and if they win, you win. You know, that, and that's that's just as good. You know, so uh, yeah, I, I, that's that. one of the coolest things uh, is ninja community for sure, and um, that's one of the, the two things that people ask me, why do you do ninja? And I'm like, well, cause I, I feel it actually genuinely inspires people. And then two is ninja community. Like I, I have a real friend. I mean, Nick Hansen is legit a greatest example of like, I feel like he's my brother and I met him because he was, you know, I, I'm about to go on the course and I'm all nervous for the first time. And he's, three people behind me and and I just asked him if you pray with me and then we met through me doing that asking him and he's like I guess and then now <laughs> I just was his you know his best man at his wedding and you know, it's just wild to see from ninja the community's very real um so definitely one of the reasons why I do ninja um yeah, I want to awesome. go back really a sweet. little bit that's, to that's uh cool. I want to go back to like the the old days of, of Ninja. When, when you first like created the show, because I remember it wasn't the way it used to be. It used to have like, I don't remember what the, it was called like camp something, but they wouldn't, there was no Vegas. There was no finals. You would just send like somebody to, to Japan if I'm not mistaken. Right. Um, and it was yeah. almost more of like a MTV, not MTV style, but like a, like a TV show to where like there's, there's teams and there's like camps and there's houses and they kind of like compete together. And that's like a very like, I almost wish I like I got to take part of that because it's so interesting and it's so dynamic and it's different. Um, why did you guys move away from that? And talk a little bit about those days when you just first like had the idea. Because I know you worked a lot with like Japan. Um, I think you guys did the show that was uh, yeah. taking like a, an American tourist to like a Japanese game show, like surviving a uh, Japanese game show, something like that. I'm, I'm assuming the idea from I survived the Japanese I survived the Japanese game show. Yeah, yeah. yeah we did two seasons for. for eight. I'm assuming and the, uh, and the idea for Sasuke came from you guys being in Japan and bringing people in Japan because it's similar, right? You take an American and you bring them to a Japanese game show, which is Sasuke, right? Um, so talk a little bit about, about like a little that different. But yeah. Well, the original, the original, you know, the original series, you know, first it was on a, a cable uh, network, so it was on G4. Uh, which doesn't exist anymore. But, um, and the original concept was to, to groom Americans to compete on Mount Midori. In Japan, when they did saw warrior team, we ended up being like a team of four. Four or five that we sent over. So there was, and we had the whole thing took place in Venice and, and, we picked the location down by the beach because, um, well, to be honest, it was like my own house. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was really easy for me to take right by to. But uh, <laughs> the fun thing was that we did all the you know, the qualifiers and, and to pick our top 12, you know, that would then go to this boot camp. Yeah. And then in the boot camp, we put them through, you know, they I think we separated them to teams and then we put them through these, you know, activities and obstacles where they competed to finally find the, the top five that we'd send on to Mount Midori Autumn. And it was like a reality competition in that regard because they lived in these 
these cabins and they, you know, and, and they bunk together. And the, although I don't remember that the reality was much of a story, it was more about the, the sports and the kind of yeah. competition each day. Cause we really didn't spend a lot of time covering the reality like we did with I survived the Japanese game show where we followed them home and there was a mama son and they had to learn the culture and it was fish out of water. So yeah. this is more about just documenting their, their journey to become, you know, a representative of America to go to Mount Midoriyama. Uh, and then once we got picked up uh, from NBC and moved on to NBC, the, the format evolved into being, we do our, we created our own Mount Midoriyama in Las Vegas. And we toured the country and went to six different cities and to scour the country to find the best Ninja Warriors to compete on Mount Midoriyama. And we held our own, we didn't need to go to Japan anymore. And the, and the other thing that happened, I think, is that we started finding out that the obstacles, the, Amer the Americans were becoming better and better, quicker and quicker. And we'd ha we had to upgrade our obstacles and, up, you know, really improve the, the quality and the difficulties of the obstacles that we were developing. And just sending them over to Mount Midoriyama. You know, when we competed in Mount Midoriyama, we, we wiped, wiped the crowd. I mean, we just, we cleaned it up. And uh, we were so much better than the competitors because, you know, I don't think they had this, the, the talent or did as much, you know, um, involvement as far as, you know, really finding talent and developing it. So we're, you know, everybody yeah. latched onto this and we, you know, we have a lot more people to pull from crossing the country and stuff. So, so that was kind of like the involvement of, of that. Yeah. What do you think about now that, you know, it's not just, Sasuke, it's American Ninja Warrior. Some arguably could say some of the best athletes are American Ninja Warrior. But then we look at all the European um, competitions. You look at Israel, uh, you know, just like c random countries to me. I don't want to call countries random. But to me, I'm thinking these are the standout companies, you know, that have. I mean, this year I'm going to Italy in, in two weeks for stuff for Ninja and Italy has Ninja and like France yeah. and you know what do you what does that look like to you for like how this has kind of hit other countries? Germany, Austria, yeah. Well, you know, um, it's it's great because it's 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 American in the world. Um, I don't know if you, I last night I was watching a little bit of the Luge and the guy from Austria competed on Austria's Ninja Warrior. He was the winner of the Austrian Ninja Warrior, and he yeah. was competing in Luge. In the Olympics, I thought that was kind of cool. Oh, really? Shout out to Ninja Warrior for it. Yeah. yeah. So that was kind of fun. I love. Listen, you gotta you gotta love that the brand you know becomes international and travels. And but I still think we've seen it. You know, you know this Grant and and Mathis. You know, we, when we do USA versus the world, they they, they can't hold a candle to us because they haven't oh, had yeah. as much years of experience. It, it's I equate it to like when basketball was introduced to the Olympics. And, you know, we just, we were so much better. America was so much better than every other country because we had been playing basketball for so many more years than everybody else. Yeah. And I mean, last summer, or the summer, the last time we had the Olympics, it was a little different story because now they're starting to catch up and they're getting stronger and they're getting better and they understand the game more. And, but as long as we have the, the, the obstacles that we are developing in the United States are superior to what other countries are doing. And we've seen this even in Australia, which is probably the second highest rated um, or in more advanced, I should say, as far as developing yeah. obstacles is still behind us by a few years as far as the, the difficulty and technical aspects of the, of the obstacles. Yeah. And, I yeah. kind of, I felt bad when they invited me out to German Ninja Warrior for their celebrity edition of their show, which of course, first off it's celebrity edition. So they're going to tone down the obstacles. And then I'm sitting there and they're briefing me on the obstacles and they're like, here's the obstacles. And I'm like, Oh, <laughs> and then they it's show a rope swing <laughs> and then they sh <laughs> now, shout out to them. But, um, they show me one of the things and they're like, and this obstacle is done like this. They show me a picture and I'm like, wait a second. I look real close and I'm like, that's a picture of me. <laughs> they sh they're showing demos of me doing that. I was like, uh Oh, and so then like to win still felt good. But it also was like, um, you know, like I'm kind of like, I mean, the biggest thing, I guess I still had to make the rope climb 80 feet in, you know, 30 seconds, which was like, that's still the same challenge. Yeah. So I felt really good about that. But also when I was doing stage one, I was like, um, <laughs> it's the same way I felt when here in Houston, a local radio station put on a 
local ninja challenge to get free all-star uh world series tickets if you won the ninja course and me and nate burkhalter went in with our hoods on so no <laughs> one would know it was us and like people were doing the courses and we're like we can't let them know because then everyone's gonna not try and you know a couple minutes it takes people to run the course and then you know fastest times like a minute and a half it went uh, <laughs> i went and ran it in 15 seconds it was like oh man <laughs> I'm sorry, everyone, but also we're going to the World Series, baby. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's definitely when I go international for these shows, um, it's it is cool to see that we are we're very progressive with obstacles in particular, uh, but also progressive with just talent and different things. And I, I like to say I I would love to go though to see Sasuke uh, in person, see where they're that's at. That's the now. one, like that's the one that I've been wanting to see. But to, to touch on that, because I've been around, like so I, I was I was on the set for French Ninja Warrior last year. I was supposed to compete. I like destroyed my shoulder, so I didn't. Uh, I actually might compete this year. They're doing the season in like two months, so I might be doing that. Um, but I think you're right that in the in the past we were just leagues above these guys. Like especially when I did USA versus the world, like the the Americans were just so much stronger. And especially because we had just finished like the same courses, it was our like second or third time to do courses. So I was very comfortable like pushing the limit because I was like I've already done this. Um, but but I think now like the the bar is being equalized. I think like if we had another like versus the world thing, I think it would be like a hard competition because going to France last year, like they had some of the obstacles that were fairly recent. They had like the dragon, the dragon bar one, dragon bag or something like that. Oh, cool. They, yeah, they had yeah, a bunch of like bag. the obstacles that we now have. And I think it's the same with Australia to where I'm also seeing these ninja gyms pop up in all of Australia and in all of France. There's, there's these ninja gyms and the culture that's been created here now with the community is slowly being formed over there so that they're catching up and they're like starting to have people that are like full time, like dedicated ninjas, which they didn't have in the past, which was why we beat them is because we have like people that are full time dedicated to this. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because when we first started the show, all the obstacle ideas came from Japan. They came from Sasuke for like the first, at least first two and a half seasons. And, and after we'd exhausted all those obstacles, we started creating our own. And now, now today you'll see that Sasuke is a combination of obstacles that we've created on the American Ninja Warrior. It's gone, it's flipped around. It's gone the other way. Yeah. Now they're you know, gone and to your point, you. um, it's, it's in France and Austria and all the other countries, you know, they're not, you know, we're not relying on, on Sasuke to get our obstacles because we, we've raised the bar so much in the technical technical aspects and the difficulty level. And uh, and it's, it continues. I mean, the obstacles that we're working on right now for this season are, you know, I thought last year was good, you know, that we created some really cool ones. And this year's even more. So it's like, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, everybody's mindset. You know, you you just keep raising the bar and um and yeah, I love to see and, that and too. nothing possible. Oh, sorry. I don't mean to interrupt. I know that lagging here is hard, but I wanted to touch on just the obstacles because what I'm seeing now, which is cool, is the youth have come in, right? And we see what well, what I what I get to see is like gangs of these youth, a ninja youth will just show up in an event, or um, you know the Caden Lebsacks and the you know these younger crowd, the Isabella Wakeums, and and they'll they'll just roll into Iron Sports like a gang of them joking and goofing, and they came in the other day with this ring, and I hope I'm not telling you know their you know their new invention here, but they had a ring. That, you know, just like a ring hop, big ring though, you know, yeah. a couple, <clears throat> probably foot <clears throat> diameter, but it had a release like a carabiner that they had manufactured <laughs> so that you could push it up. And then as it hit something, it would carabiner out, go in and then lock so that it's a different way to use a ring. So you could ring hop it. And then also this like, and I'm thinking, oh boy, the youth now are just generating. And you know, uh, the leader of that, I would say is um, the maker ninja, obviously Kevin Carbone being a, yeah. a younger guy compared to me, I'm 33, right? So, but c compared to me being a younger guy, watching his brain function and think of like how to create obstacles it's really cool to me. That's like one of the innovations that's happening as a part of the show that, you know, you guys are doing as you invent. And it's also happening outside of the show. That's just kind of progressing the ideas and creativity that I think is really cool to watch. That's very true. I mean, I said it earlier. It's uh, when the community starts, you know, 
helping create obstacles. And, and a lot of times they have really, really cool ideas. Some of them are out there, some, but, but it gets us in the right mode. It gets us, you know, in a frame of mind where we go, Hey, there's something here. Let's do this. Let's do that. And, you know, cause it's one thing to create something that is very cool and, and, and new and innovative, but we also have to know that it's got to work for a wide spectrum, a wide range of, of skill sets. And, you know, we have to figure out which obstacle it's going to position in. Is it a four? Is it a five? Is it an eight? Is it a seven? You know, a nine? I mean, and um, so all those things have to play into it. But uh, it's wonderful. It's, it's a great. It pushes us. It, it helps us. It, it, the whole creative process. You know, it's, it's, it goes back to, um, you know, uh, a, 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 you know, mindset of, of, of a masses. You know, when the mindset of the masses is working on the same collective, this collective thought pattern, then you advance much faster. You know, this collective consciousness that, that exists within the community to, to push the obstacles, to create new obstacles is, um, it's wonderful, yeah. But it gets everybody in the same thing. And, it, you know, it's like when you, it's, it's why when we see a movie about the same subject matter appear and you have like three movies about the same subject matter, it's because that consciousness is out there. Someone had this idea, they threw it out in the universe and then every, all these other creative people grabbed that idea out of the universe yeah. and started making their own version. And, and I think the same thing kind of exists here with the, with the development of the obstacles too. I think it's a good point. And I hope that everyone's starting to get there, right? We've seen so much division lately with COVID and in the vaccines and all this different stuff and politically. And, and then we see promotion of let's do this together, whatever that might be. Let's think about this together. I even just uh, listened to a, uh, a guy come speak and, and hearing him talk about, we, even if this person's opposing you, let's talk together. Let's, and, and that whole idea is a heightened place. It is more can be done. Even a, a TikTok. That's right. I'm, oh. I'm on TikTok. I listened to last night, a management uh, guy was talking about better management. He's like, it's not that you need to have all the answers. Instead, ask people how they can help you solve them. And that that's, that's, I hope where we're going, right? That's what we want to do as a group. And that you're touching on that. There's that greater conscious thought that creates more things. That's, that's yeah. where I hope we're headed. Yeah, uh, I, I, Alex Weber's got a new um, show on Facebook that, he, that he's doing that's just exactly about this. You know, of course, we're different. Of course, we're going to have different opinions. Of course, everybody's, you know, has their own unique look at things. But being respectful of everybody and, 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 and just having open dialogue about it, you know, rather than mm -hmm. he's wrong because he doesn't think the way I think or they're wrong. And, you know, and and, you know. I mean, listen, not, this is not a political discussion, but I blame the news media for creating this, this separatism, this, this whole, yeah. you know, because they're not about promoting, you know, collective consciousness and like, hey, let's all figure this out, even though we may differ, you know, you said vaccines and some people want it, some people don't. Everybody has their own opinions, why or why not? But but just embrace them as, as fellow human beings and like, OK, I respect you for that, you know, and and have a dialogue but rather than, you know throw people under the bus constantly or say you're wrong or you should be, you know, the, the world's in a scary place right now when you see people being, you know, um, criticized and, and, you know, and punished for, for their beliefs, you know, and um, so, yeah, I think that's a very good point you make, Grant, which is, you know, just being open to other people and being this collective consciousness about, hey, you know, we all want to live in this peaceful world and create yeah. joy for everyone else and, uh Ultimately, we all want to love and be loved. So, you know, <laughs> it's, it's good. Uh, I hope that's where we're headed, man. Yeah. I'm just trying to be loved out here. I'm that's just trying funny. to, I'm just trying to find some, she can love my somebody. Somebody love me. <laughs> Someone um, love me. Well, I love you, Grant. I love you if you don't want to. Everybody I know you loves do, Grant. Man. There's, there should be something. There, there's something here, a campaign about everybody loves Grant or Grant needs love. Or, <laughs> can we change the podcast know? to everybody loves Grant? <laughs> everybody can loves Grant. <laughs> I, guess, I, I, can't wait, I can't wait till I tune in next time. There's a big scratch across the sign. It's just kind of nice. There's every, a big post and a sticker over it. Says everybody loves Grant. <laughs> just Grant. No, I definitely, I definitely do. And, and I hope one of my goals is, is to take, I do feel loved a lot and that I, I hope that um, the same way you want to encourage people and change lives through that. I do have an abundance of love from people and, uh, and, and my understanding of God loving me. And, and I hope I can turn that into a way to help people too, whether that's uh, talking from the positive perspective I have. I do, I am a very optimistic person and I do come from a very joyous place and some people don't, and they, they have a different approach and sometimes it's not the best. Sometimes it's just really negative. And I'm like, 
hey, what about if we did it? And just like you what were saying how, we um, you know, if we just constantly compute data that's negative, we act off of the negative data and put in as if our brain was a computer. Well, I have a tendency to just have a lot of positive because I've also been through a lot of stuff and and I know what it's like to be right. in just negative thoughts and and how that how that had to be fought against with some positivity to kind of stay afloat. The positivity at times was the A light to float. shine out the darkness. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, man. Um, so. Okay. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I have a, a few more topics I want to discuss with you. Um, what is a, what is your actual role with Ninja Warrior look like nowadays? Like what is your tangible like contribution or workload look like, like on a day to day if you're, and I don't even know, maybe what are you doing like nowadays? Like is, is a lot of your time be taken up by Ninja Warrior? Do you do a lot of obstacle design? Do you do a lot of like the um, the logistics or what is what is your role look like these days? So everything for, you know, from soup to nuts, you know, I'm still involved with everything. So uh, I don't watch as many of the casting tapes as I used to, but involved in, you know, the, the, the tail end of it when we do- start designing, you know, who's going to be in what city and how we divvy that up and and who are final, you know, because we can only take so many, so many people. Right. Uh, obviously involved in the obstacle designs and, and the course designs especially. Um, but now it's grown and we have a big team. So I, I don't, you know, listen, I am a big believer in delegating authority and responsibility too. Yeah. I, I don't have to micromanage something that I don't have to be so hands-on like I was in the beginning and like in the, in the first, you know, eight, nine years where I had to be really involved. Uh, but now I've got a team of people that get it, you know, and they've been doing yeah doing it for a while. And so, you know, I don't, I, now I can just, you know, kind of more just give opinions and tweaks and adjustments and say, well, this work and that work, try this. And so I'm involved in all the obstacles and the new obstacles that come in. Um, I don't design as many as I used to, um, but I still am very involved in it. I have a call today to talk about the obstacles for Vegas um, and what we're doing. But, um, and then, you know, Anthony, and I pretty much do the course designs, you know, he'll lay them out, then I'll tweak them here and there. And, um, we'll figure out what goes where and what we swap out, you know, cause it's, it's changed. You know, we have the, you know, the, 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 the choice between the two obstacles, you're right. Yeah. You know, yeah. the two balance obstacles now. So we have to figure out how that, you know, there's logistics in that and stuff like that, in which in, we always introduce a new balance obstacle. So, and then, yeah. you know, just, you know, making sure everything, you know, the look, the design, I go on the survey, I, knew, I picked, you know, the location out. You know where the how the course gets set up in in San Antonio because we're gonna be in San Antonio first, and you know the layout of the course and working with the art department on that and how it looks, what the new looks are, and okay, and yeah. So very involved, and I always you know always will be you know I mean in the beginning I set up the whole direction for the show and how it was, all the cameras were laid out and you know and but after after I do that stuff then I, I you know I I start delegating once it's all set up I like to create shows and set them up and, and design the whole look and design the, the formats and then. And then find people to, to execute them. Uh, yeah. But I feel very active in this one, and and as you you see me at all, you know, all, I'm always there. So yeah, for sure. You know, I go to all the obstacle testing when we do obstacle testing. Uh, we have one last two weeks ago. I have some more coming up. So um, we get to test them out, and then we compare notes and sit down and tweak this, do this, try this. You know, and it's it's fun. It's fun. You guys, you guys know yeah, what it's like. Been a part of it for yeah. sure. That's a good yeah. touch. Um, that's something that I've like with building the team for the podcast, like at first, like it was just me and I was kind of doing everything. And now I have a team. I have a, uh, I have Rocky who's behind the cameras. He's switching angles. He, he writes notes for me for clips. And I, we just got an editor. Um, his name is Juan. He's actually the guy who creates like a bunch of fan art for Ninja Warrior, but he DM me and he's like, Hey, uh, can I edit for you? And we're working with him and he's a great guy, but I'm, I'm starting to learn like what leadership looks like. And, and Grant actually Grant hopping on the podcast has been like a great, addition because I'm understanding that before I felt like I was micromanaging everybody and I had to like I was doing the work twice right they were doing it and then I was redoing it but learning to kind of let go of that and finding people that fit those roles perfectly to where I can focus my energy on on things that'll give greater hey. dividends right it's it's like it's it's a huge learning experience but do you have any tips on leadership and that because you I mean you've grown huge companies right like how in, in leadership like where just give me some leadership tips or just some, some tips on growing a company to, to the level of success that you have. Well, yeah, I, you know, it, it, there's different stages. In the beginning, you have to be very focused on all the details. You have to be very hands-on and you work very hard. And But as you grow the company, it's really important to find people 
that you can trust that can you can start delegating to and and executing your vision because uh, yeah. that's the only way you grow because otherwise we we only have so much bandwidth in, in, personally right so you can't, yeah. can't grow unless you, you expand your your team so you you said it already which is something that i've learned um is to is to grow your team and that allows you to grow um but i also think that you have to create a culture within your team uh that is aligned with your with your purpose and your goals and your outcome for what you want um, and and they if, if they follow that if they follow that vision, and then then you have much easier to create the outcome that you want without getting into too much details. It's about forming a culture, um, getting everybody on board with that culture, and creating a work environment that encourages them and inspires them to want to do their best and work for you, not just go and punch a clock and work nine to five. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And I really think the companies that do that are become much more successful much quicker. Yeah, no, I mean, it's great advice. Yeah. Form a culture, get people on board, and then inspire them to continue that movement. Yeah, yeah. there's a three, yeah. little three steps there's, there if, for somebody. There's a, um, there's a company called um, uh, mindvalley.com, which, which started by Vishen Lakiani. And one of the things that he does for all his employees is he, he has this thing called the MIQ, the three most important questions. And he asks them the three most important questions on their interview and when they start. And... And what this does is it kind of gets you into the heads of where these people are, what their dreams and their goals and their wishes are. And then he says, what's one of these things that you want to achieve? And then he tasks them to achieve that in a certain time period. And what that does is it tells the employee that the company's invested in them. If they're in the company and they're invested in the company helping this, it creates a two way street. Yeah. Which I, which is part of their culture scape that they have at Mind Valley, which is, if if you do well as an individual, the company will do well also. Yeah. Um, yeah. And right now I'm growing my 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 company LiveYourPurpose.com L I V E U R Purpose is uh, I just hired my fourth employees. So I have four employees now, and you know it's about the same thing. And I tell them I teach them the same thing. It's like. And what, you know, and I want, and I, and I expect them to have the same lifestyle health habits that I have, that mindfulness practice. I don't want, you know, it's like, if you don't want, if you don't want to have those habits, you don't want to be healthy and active and, and mindful, then, then, then this isn't the company for you. Then go work. Some, there's plenty of places to work, but I want to be able to have you grow with me. You know, I want to, you know, have you learn. And, and cause if they're on the same page, then we're going to grow faster and, and they're going to be really vested in, in helping the growth of this because it's something they believe in already. Yeah, no, I think that's huge. I mean, my, my dad works at a startup right now. And like one of his, like anytime he's leading people or working with people, he, his biggest, um, biggest thing he, he puts a, an importance on is making sure that the person is happy with their job and they enjoy what they're doing and that they're not just doing it to, to kind of punch a clock. Right. And, that's like a thing that I've realized is like what makes, so everything you're saying is, is stuff that, that totally makes sense. Um, in terms of, of business development and growth. Um, now you posted something on Instagram the other day about sleep and I actually, I used to sleep like really great and I still do in essence, but I've been like struggling a little bit to, to fall asleep lately. And I feel like I'm the only like reason I know that I'm sleeping is cause I'm remembering dreams and I'm like, okay, I did sleep, but I feel like I'm like waking up a lot and I buy like an aura ring. Um, but I actually don't like it because I'll be like, I'll be sleeping and I'll kind of wake up and then. I'm like sitting there and I'm thinking like, man, my aura ring is going to like tell me I had trash sleep and then I'm going to feel worse. And so I just like rip it off my finger and I'm like, F that. So I just kind of lay down and sleep normally. And so that, I've realized that like, yeah, that information is, is good to have, but it's the fact that I'm like overanalyzing it and like stressing out about it and it's making me sleep less. I'm like, I can't, I can't wear this ring right now. So what are, what are those sleep tips for you? Yeah. Like, help, help me out. I'm trying to sleep better. <laughs> Well, here's the thing, you know, you brought up the aura ring and I'm glad you did because I've, I've had an aura ring and I went through a whole, whole phase where I've always slept maybe five or six hours and, and felt great. And then I started reading all these studies and, you know, read some books about sleep and all this stuff and everything was saying, you got to sleep eight hours, you got to sleep eight hours, you know, cell regeneration. And this is where the brain restores itself. And I'm, you know, I'm very much into biohacking and longevity. And so I said, well, maybe I'm not getting enough sleep. Maybe I need to get my eight hours. And whenever I slept eight hours, I always felt groggy, but I said, okay, I'm going to get my, aura. I had my aura wing and I type, you know, I 
did this and I did it for like eight months and um, I threw away the oar ring. I mean, I haven't thrown it away. I just, I said, like you, too much information. I, I just bought it and I'm already want to throw brain. it away. It's talking with my brain. <laughs> it's telling me stuff that, you know what? Sometimes you got to go with how you feel. You can't Absolutely. just that the, the science is, okay, so guess what? You only got 15% of deep sleep. You only got 20 minutes of deep sleep. And I'm like, and then you know, my brain goes, well, deep sleep's where you get all the regenerative action. <laughs> deep sleep. And I'm like, oh, f- I'm not getting enough. Then I'm, I'm not getting enough deep sleep. And then I'm like, wait, stop, stop, stop. How do you feel? Well, I feel, I feel fine. I feel great. You know, it's like, yeah. it's like doctor, doctor used to tell me when I go to my checkup, said you're anemic. I go, what, what does that mean? He goes, well, you, you, your iron counts low, you're anemic. And, and I go, well, what does that mean? And, and it's however my day goes, well, you must be really tired during the day. I go, I'm not tired. Yeah. No, but you must be like falling asleep and you must have no energy. I have plenty of, I have tons of energy. I've got, but no, that's impossible. Well, I, I'm telling you that's, so yeah. how you feel is how you, is, is the best way to judge what you need to do if there's any changes yeah. you make. As that's a big sleep, thing. So sort of sleep. Stop watching, get off your phone, stop watching the screens, get off that an hour before bedtime. Always. Yeah. You got to stop. You got to stop. You got to shut your brain. Your brain needs to slow down. You got you need, you need to have downtime. You need to kind of unwind. Yeah. And and what that does is it starts the process. You have, we all have circadian rhythms. It starts the process of creating melatonin. And it's much better to create it naturally in your body through your pineal gland, which is back here. And that creates, starts releasing melatonin, which signals your body is ready for sleep. Just watching this up until the minute you want to go to sleep and then taking some melatonin pills doesn't do it. It's not the same thing. And it creates actually, I have found it to create, you know, restless sleep. Less, you know, I, I mean, to your point, when, I, when I've tried all this stuff and, um, and I just found that the best way to do it is to get, you know, to start unwinding, not eat three hours before, before bed because then your body's not busy digesting food. It's relaxed and you're not, it's not working. Um, so that everything folk, everything in you, you want to prime your body to be focused for sleep. Yeah. For and sure. that's, yeah. that's really, those are the two, the biggest tips and, um, more, if you want more tips today, the, the viewers can go live your purpose.com. They're all listed there. And I, I think the IG post that I did two days ago has a few others as well. Um, yeah. I'm doing a whole, um, next Sunday, I'm doing a whole sleep discussion on Facebook live, yeah. which, uh, which I'm going to talk more about. So I'll send you the link to that when, when we do that. But cause a yeah, lot of people, yeah. I'll be down um, to hop on that. Um, yeah, but no, I mean with the, everything you said about the O ring, I'm glad you said it now. Cause I was kind of fighting with like, I just bought this thing. Do I use it? And I'm thinking like, man, if I wake up and this thing tells me, Oh, you have a like super shit readiness score. You're going to feel awful, but I feel great. I still feel like I'm going to go do stuff and like work out harder and do stuff. But vice versa, if I wake up and I feel super groggy and tired, but my ready to score is like a hundred, I'm still going to be more tired. Like, you know what I mean? So I'm like, what's the point at the end of the day? <laughs> I think, I think we're in this just Grant's opinion. We're going to have this like Grant's opinion moment. <laughs> where I mean, I, I love just, the concept. I, I, really- I will cut it out. Oh, we got a, we little- had a weird moment of internet. Yeah, I just I think that um, I think that we're in a a, a thing that happened. I, I've seen it where Internet came into existence during my life period. And then now I've realized we went from like, oh, Internet's cool. Oh, we can connect even more. OK, now we're seeing downsides. We can be on it too long. We can we can have any information anytime we want. We can know anything. We don't have to pull out an encyclopedia. We just Google it. And so now with the over um access of data we see issues maybe like this where we can now generalize and describe ourselves uh while in webmd or anything or if i feel something one way or if i'm if i was supposed to be a certain way i just i now just go look at it and it says oh my data says i didn't do this enough or i have my wearable that tells me this isn't this which have great intentions but yes can tell us well, you didn't actually sleep. My whoop said that I was only in this portion of REM sleep. And how I, and it's like, ah, man, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. being able to diagnose yourself or be able to even think of yourself via diagnosis, like, well, I am this or I am that. I, you know, I, I, I see a lot of issues because of that. But there's a term for that. It's like, it's like too much. I don't know. I, I'm drawing a blank on the term, but it's like over information is bad. Like, there's a certain point to where like having information is good. When you have too much of it, it becomes like overwhelming and it's more counterproductive and destructive yeah. than having nothing. 
Yeah. Well, well it, 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 you know, it shapes your, it shapes your thoughts, create your reality. So if you, you know, you read this, this data that comes and, and you take that input and you go, well, all of a sudden it becomes real to you and you can manifest that, you know, even if you feel fine, all of a sudden, it's, well, it says I'm supposed to be tired. Huh, am I feeling tired? I don't, you know, it's like, you <laughs> can create, yeah, it's like, <laughs> it's like, it's really, really strange, but uh, listen, the, 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 it, the thing is, and I posted about this recently too, is whatever is going on in your life and we all have stuff that we're dealing with, it's really important not to let your circumstances define you. Yeah. You know, we are much, much bigger than our circumstances, much, much bigger than our ailments or our disabilities or our, our lackings or, you know, or, you know, we are, we're much bigger than that um, on a, on a big scale. So I, I, you know, I invite everybody just to, to remember that, you know, don't let those things define you. Don't, yeah. you know, cause you don't want to be the person at the party that, that's going like, Oh, I suffer from anxiety. I'm, I suffer from depression or I, you know, I, you know, I can't do that because I, uh, you know, I stubbed my toe or whatever it is. Or I have, you know, yeah. um, I used <laughs> no, it as a, it's good. Go ahead. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's a really good point. And that's what I was trying to get at is that people have decided something or found out something about them, even as far as like they do an Enneagram test and they're like, this is me, this is how I see the world. Or even the good things that I think were meant for good, we can define ourselves off of them. It can be problematic. So what he, what he just said, oh, is, is something like that. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Jordan Peterson, but we, we saw him live a couple weeks ago, but his daughter said like that, that's one of the the best things that it, her, her dad ever told her. Uh, Michaela Peterson, this is Jordan Peterson's daughter. She was saying that she, she had a bunch of illnesses as a child. I don't think it was like a, a, a list of things, but she said that the best tip her dad gave her was to, her dad said, never let your, your, uh, illnesses or what was the word? Let, let let your condition pretty much define you and never use it as an excuse not to do things or not to be someone or not to follow your dream. Right. Yeah. And we, she said that was, yeah. Huge. We will go down in history as the worst Jordan Peterson quoters of all time. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, but I, I, you know, it's funny. I used it when I, I told the story of when I lost the sight of my left eye and it didn't stop me from doing anything. It didn't, you know, I didn't, it didn't define me. It didn't like, Oh, and they said, well, listen, it's going to be hard for you to drive. And it's gonna be hard for you to to serve. It's gonna be hard for you to do. It's like I mean, I didn't listen to a word they said. It's like blah 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 blah. It's like I didn't want to hear it. It's like you know what? Let me decide if it's hard for me. You know, it's like so. Guess yeah. what? Driving, you turn your head a little bit more to see the mirror. Uh, surfing, I have to. I get. I'm really good at turning my head this way now because 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 yeah. I can't. I don't have any peripheral vision. So, you know, so when I got to look left with a wave coming, I I have to turn farther. So what? You know, it's like there's little things. You know, but. But it's, it doesn't define you, but it, you know, it can be, you can embrace it and make it, you know, yeah, make it work for you. Good. You know, it's just, it doesn't change us. It doesn't change who we are. Um, and I know so many people that I, I, I've met in my life who, who use it. And, and you brought up a really good point about success as well. The success shouldn't define you either. Whether you're an Oscar winner or a champion at, at uh, sports or an athlete or something, that's not who you really are. Yeah. Just because I, you know, produced all these shows and I'm successful producer and director and, you know, nominations and all that, that doesn't, that's not who I am. That's not just yeah. me. I mean, it's, it's it, it doesn't. So, yeah, you can, and there's a lot of people that I've talked to and I, I've always been very, very decent at doing this. Um, but a lot of the ninjas that become like diehard ninjas that only have ninja in their life, they, they fall for this trap of define, like they'll have a really bad year because they had a bad year in Ninja and they define themselves by the performance that they have on the show, right? If they have a great year, then they have a great year after that. They're like, man, I did great like this. I'm like a great athlete and all the work I've been putting in. Uh, but if they have a bad year, which I mean, I, I think the last time I competed on American Ninja Warrior, like I, I did a whole like two obstacles and then I fell, right? Signed me up for a bad year too. Yeah, too. so we didn't do great. But I remember like, <laughs> I remember having other things in my life to, to go to next and, and Ninja wasn't like my end all be all. And I remember like, that's always been something that's kept me healthy, like, in terms of like not letting this thing that I, that I love consume me to a point to where if it goes away, right. If, if the show goes away or, or I end up not being able to compete anymore, for some reason, like some of these things happen, um, I, I still am okay. I still have other things. I still have other passions and it's, it's not, my identity isn't wrapped up in this one thing. And I think right. that's something I always want to tell like new ninjas, people that are very passionate at this point. And they're like, yeah, I love ninjas as a thing. I'm always like telling them, um, or if I'm mentoring somebody, I, I tell them like, look, like it's great. It's fun. It's amazing. It's for a season in your life. It's not going to be forever. Like it's, it's not a full-time career. Do other things. Don't skip out on certain things because 
of Ninja. I mean, I like examples like I didn't go to prom because I went to like the Houston taping of Ninja Warrior. Now, I don't regret that because I didn't care for prom. I was trying to see Ninja Warrior. But it's an example I used to like, li- you know, live your life and do other things other than just like the thing that consumes you. Right. Yeah. You got to have balance. Yeah. And you have to have priorities, too. I mean, it's not going to, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it's your health is the, for me. My health is the most important thing. And number two, the fam- my family is number two. And then everything else, there's a, you know, a hierarchy for that, too. Yeah. And if you put your life into priorities and and then it becomes very easy to make decisions. So if I'm on the call with work or something and my son comes in and says, Dad, I need you to help me with this. If I can break away from that call to go help him, I will. Yeah. Because work is not as high a priority. Yeah. Uh, and, and then if you live by your priorities, then it, it, it becomes much easier to create balance in your life. Well, we've taken some of your priority time and uh, we want to just school. Go. The kids are in school. <laughs> All right. On. I, do, uh, I could well, I could use a, a little workout, though, so I can. Well, if you need any of that, I got all kinds that I've been posting lately, um, <laughs> and I can always show you. I, I, being outside of Ninjas last year has been awesome. Just other companies and other avenues of CrossFit to, you know, everything. So if you ever want to chat in, yeah. that just hit me up. But um, one question we've been ending with that we want to end here um, in just a way that, like, try not to butcher it this time. <laughs> yeah, last time. Dude, last time I did it was you horrible. Oh my gosh! Well, you asked me to do those rapid fire questions. That really put me for a tailspin. Oh my! I'm not even gonna tell. Yeah, no, we're just gonna move on from that. Yeah, no one, no one remember that. Don't go listen to that last one. But um, one thing that we we just want to know is there something that we could pray for you? If we could pray for something for you, what would that be? What what could we do to pray for you in uh, this coming, you know, this week even? Um, I like that. I like that. Just um, it, that I, I mean, I, I, gosh, I, I, want, I always think of other people. Like it's like uh, for me, I, I have everything. I'm blessed. I have everything I could, I could need. I would just say pray for that, you know, um, that I'm always conscious and continue to be conscious and compassionate and grateful for, for my life. So, um, yeah, those are the kind of wishes that, you know, would support me the most and, you know, consciousness be- of, of being grateful. Um, the, the root of gratefulness actually is, is to me the wellspring that pours out to other people. And they see that through joy, um, and all these other yeah. things, but that is the fill up place that spills out. And so you are, you are thinking of others when you do that. I think sometimes we think of things as selfish if we ask for something for ourselves, but, um, even how you have your health over your family, because, if you're not alive, you can't care for your family. Yeah. So it's not, you know, it seems like, oh, oh yeah. you could it's see that as being true. selfish. It's like, no, you got to take care of yourself so you can take care of people. And that same way, gratitude is kind of the wellspring that pours out. So yeah, I hope our listeners can, you know, cool. You know, I'm going to prepare for that. Real quick, a shout out to Patreon. Uh, if you guys want to watch this full episode, we have a full video set up. You can see Kent and us talking. <laughs> if you're listening to this and you want to check out the full video episode, go to patreon.com slash kind of nice. We have 20 plus episodes now, full video. We also have a YouTube channel where we're releasing some older videos. You can check out uh, the kind of nice podcast on YouTube. Um, Kent, it's been an honor having you. It's been great talking again. Uh, go ahead and shout out your... Um, yeah, where can people find that? The I, I want people to know thing. too to go live follow your, liveyourpurpose.com, L I V E U R purpose.com. And um, go there. You can find out my meditation program, mindfulness program is called Taming Your Monkey Mind How to Create a Stress Free and Joyful Life in 10 Minutes a Day. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's awesome. It works. And it's, uh, I welcome you guys to try it out. And there's lots of free stuff on liveyourpurpose.com to get you going. And tips and advice and uh, i'm always there to answer questions so thank you guys so much for having me on your podcast it's kind of nice and i <laughs> look forward to being on, look forward to being uh on um who loves grant coming up next and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, been, it's been a pleasure all right guys it's been the kind of nice podcast we'll catch you guys on the next one peace I'm kinda nice with the gear, yeah. Shout out my area, cold, cold. I'm feeling nice with the drill, drill. And now I'm about to bury the flow, oh.